MDS and AML are uh, two diseases that are uh, a continuum and these are both related to each other. Uh, the way we define MDS and AML are basically MDS is a condition where we have abnormal changes in the bone marrow. These may be in the red cells, these may be in the platelets, uh, these may be in the white cells. And usually we count the blasts in the bone marrow. And the blasts are basically cells that have an abnormal structure, architecture. The pathologist will be able to see these in the bone marrow. Routinely, we all have some normal blast. Uh, usually, they're less than 5%. But in some patients, you have increased and abnormal blast. And usually, if they're between 5 to 20%, that's kind of when we're thinking that this is more of a MDS kind of disease. When the blast percentage is above 20%, that's when we think the threshold has been cut and it is going into acute myeloid leukemia. So if you're a patient, I think the question you would ask your doctor is, based on his bone marrow evaluation, does he see an increased number of blasts? And if he does see an increased number of blasts, you know, where the number is and whether he thinks this is MDS or uh, AML. Now, that being said, the differentiation in blast is a little bit arbitrary because one may imagine that you could have 19% blast or 21% blast, and we don't really think that it is a strict cutoff. So we do look in a number of other things, such as molecular features, uh, chromosome abnormalities, and we try to put all that together because if we have a young patient who has a high blast percentage, we may start treating them as an AML kind of approach. Uh, also, what's very important is there are a number of mutations and chromosome changes that predict from transformation of MDS to AML. And a lot of work is now being focused on identifying early on mutations that will predict that a particular patient with MDS will progress to acute myeloid leukemia versus a particular patient with MDS who will stay as MDS. And this is very important because the treatments that we give may be tailored both in intensity, frequency, sometimes we may not even need to treat people with early MDS. So when to treat aggressively and more importantly when not to treat uh, can be determined now at least to some extent, not perfectly, with the molecular uh, chromosome uh, changes that are seen in patients with MDS. De novo and secondary AML are uh, two different varieties of acute myeloid leukemia. We usually differentiate these two based on the uh, factors that result in the disease. So de novo acute myeloid leukemia makes the majority of the disease. This is about 80% of all the AML patients that present to us. Uh, these patients usually have a spontaneous occurrence of the acute myeloid leukemia. We're not usually able to identify an underlying triggering factor or an exposure or a chemotherapy radiation that led to it. On the other hand, about 15 to 20 percent of AML presents as what we call secondary AML. And even within secondary AML, there are two main groups. So there's secondary AML from what we call pre-existing hematological disease. So these are patients who've had a prior blood disorder, such as MDS, myeloproliferative disease, aplastic anemia, which over time has progressed to acute myeloid leukemia. And then the second group in the secondary AML is people who have had prior exposure to chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So you could be a patient with breast cancer or colon cancer or GI tumor that had received chemotherapy or radiation for that specific tumor. And over years, that chemotherapy or radiation led to DNA damage that later manifests as acute myeloid leukemia. So those two groups are put into secondary AML. The distinction between these is very important because secondary AML is usually associated with more complex chromosome changes, as well as we are now learning more adverse molecular mutations, and in general responds less favorably to high-dose chemotherapy, which has been our standard backbone treatment for a new AML that is not secondary. So now there are new approaches to target secondary AML independently as a separate condition and entity. A number of uh, novel therapies are now emerging for treating patients with high-risk MDS and uh, AML. The way I like to think about these are in two big categories. So we have what we call the uh, molecular therapies, targeted therapies that have been around for a long time and are showing good efficacy. In AML, two of them have recently been approved. One of them is a FLT3 inhibitor called mitostorin that targets a particular mutation. This mutation is called the FLT3 mutation. It's seen in about one third of patients with acute myeloid leukemia. And when this FLT3 inhibitor was given in combination with standard chemotherapy, it improved response rates and survival in patients. 
The other mutation in AML that has now emerged as becoming important is the IDH mutation. There are actually two types of IDH mutation, IDH1, IDH2. And in people with AML, what we have noticed is if we target the IDH mutation using new drugs called IDH inhibitors, we're actually able to produce responses with single targeted therapy without chemotherapy. Uh, the second big group uh, in acute myeloid leukemia and MDS that is emerging as becoming important in the last few years is the immune therapies. And there are actually two or three different approaches to immunotherapy. Uh, some of you in the audience may have heard about these. One of these is called the CAR T cells. So there's now emerging data, not so much yet in AML, but in ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a related disease where CAR T cells are being very effective. So CAR T cells are basically T cells taken from your own body that have been expanded, activated, and re-injected to fight against the tumor cells. And there are now efforts in AML uh, that are looking at CAR T cells with some early data being shown in 2017 that these could be effective. The other approaches to immunotherapy that are more commonly available and are being used in a wider scope are what we call monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies that are targeting a particular antigen or marker that is expressed on AML MDS cells. And usually when they target this, they release a toxin payload that has been linked to the antibody. One of these called gemtuzumab, uh, which is a CD33 antibody, was actually approved about eight months ago for the treatment of patients with acute myeloid leukemia, both in combination with chemotherapy as well as the standalone therapy. Now, a third group of drugs that, especially in MDS, has been used very widely and is also used in elderly AML or in relapsed AML is what we call epigenetic therapy or hypomethylating agents. Uh, these have been around for about 15 years. There are two major hypomethylating uh, drugs that have been used these are azacitidine as well as decidabine. Now each of these as a single agent can have about a 30 to 35 percent response rate in patient with high-risk MDS or an elderly patient with acute myeloid leukemia. But where we're really seeing the benefit of these is when we combine them with other agents and there are two or three combinations now showing very, very powerful, attractive data. One of them is combining epigenetic therapy, azacitidine or decidabine, with a new BCL2 inhibitor. BCL2 is an important pathway in AML, and there's a drug that blocks it called venetoclax. And the combination of azacitidine and venetoclax is now showing us response rates of 70, 75 percent in new diagnosed AML. There are now studies starting in high-risk MDS, which we're going to be very excited to see if we see the same thing. The other uh, drug that is showing very good activity in combination with hypomethylating agents is immune checkpoint treatments. So we're now doing combinations of azacitidine with immune checkpoint drugs. Immune checkpoint drugs also are an immune therapy that activates your T cells. These have been approved in multiple solid tumors. And again, with that combination, we're seeing in the frontline setting response rates of 65 to 70 percent. So this is really dramatic because historically we would expect 25 to 30 percent response rates with azacitidine and decitabine alone. Today, in the last one and a half, two years, we're talking about 65 to 75 percent. So not even doubling, but tripling of the responses. And now the data is also coming out that these responses are durable. The survival seems to be significantly improved. So I think in the next one or two years, there's really going to be a dramatic change in treatment of frontline AML, MDS, using these different molecular immune epigenetic therapy combinations. I highly recommend uh, patients with uh, high-risk MDS or AML consider clinical trials. We know now that there have been four drugs approved in AML. There are potentially another two or three that will be coming this year, as well as in MDS. There's a lot of excitement with some of the new epigenetic and immune therapies. We have to realize that all of these drugs got approved because of clinical trials. And although we're happy with the progress, there's still huge progress to be made. And now that we have new drugs, there are going to be novel combinations as well as second, third generation, but all of these will be available initially in clinical trial. So for patients, my strong recommendation would be that if you have the ability to consider getting on a clinical trial that uses some of the newer agents, novel combinations, this will probably give you the best chance of getting the most effective therapy three to four years before it's available, as well as help the field understand these treatments and move forward.